Hi. Hi. Thanks, everyone, for coming. First, uh, one apology from my side, because this talk was supposed to be a joint talk between me and one colleague of mine, but due to health issues, he had to cancel. So uh, I'm going to, to do it on, on my own. So before I start with the talk, a bit about me and the company I'm coming from. So uh, I work for N26. I guess most of you people have heard around here about N26. Basically, we are a digital bank. We have a tech hub here in Barcelona, which is growing very fast. And uh, we have a lot of people around here in, uh, uh, in the conference. So if you really want to hear a bit more about all the challenges that we are facing, uh, just come and talk with us. About uh, one of the mission statements of, of, uh, of the company is building a bank the world loves to use. And basically, uh, having this in mind, we have a lot of challenges that we are faced with. And today, I'll be talking about one of the things we did in the past six months. Uh, I've been with the company since March. That's when I moved to Barcelona. Previously, I've worked uh, uh, in one US company called Upwork, there where I was building a digital marketplace for freelancers. Uh, and after that, I joined uh, N26, and I was faced with uh, uh, very exciting challenges here. And one of them is a thing that we, we started changing in the past uh, several months. Basically, we, we introduced a backend for front-end strategy, and we wanted to change how things are served to, to our end users. I, I won't be talking much about open APIs here. It's, it, the talk is mostly about about how we are serving content uh, to, to our users, how we did it previously, what we changed, and what are the gains of it, and what are the challenges that we are still facing with the new approach. Uh, to start with what we had previously in, in our architecture, basically we have a microservice architecture like most of the companies that, uh, uh, that that use it. Basically, we had uh, a bunch of microservices separated into sep uh, several business domains. And we have our mobile clients. We have uh, an iOS and Android app, and we have a web application. How they were communicating with our uh, microservice uh, layer in the back end is they were making multiple calls to, to the microservices to get the data. Actually, they were in charge of aggregating the data. Once the aggregation was done, then we had a layer of uh, this NXD mapping layer, which is uh, abbreviation for what, uh, the, what we call uh, the N26 cross-platform uh, cross design library. Basically, our uh, design team together with our front-end teams came up with a design library and a way to standardize our front-end so that all the users are, are facing the same user experience across all the platforms that we are supporting. So that's what we had, and uh, additional to that, what, uh, what was done in, in, in our mobile clients was beside the data aggregation, uh, the clients were, were handling the translations of, of, of the, the texts that are shown to the user, then uh, they were handling dynamic assets. So basically, when, when you send a request to some backend service, Depending of, on, on the response you get from it, you have to visually show something to, to the user. Sometimes this uh, visual representation for the user requires to add some, some digital assets like logos, images, and this kind of stuff. So the, the, the handling of the digital dynamic assets was done in the, uh, in the mobile apps. And in the end, we had this layer of uh, mapping to our visual components, which was separately implemented in each of our uh, mobile applications. So what, what were the cons of this approach and why we decided to change this architecture? First, we were doing the uh, API aggregation on the mobile app. And this like requires uh, our, uh, our mobile applications to make sometimes several requests to the backend. And this increases uh, CPU usage and memory usage. And uh, also, it, it ha we have to handle uh, scenarios like resiliency when we have latency in some of the services, 
what to do with with fallbacks in case the service is, uh, is not available and the user is, uh, has to wait a certain amount of time just to, get, uh, ju just to get some feedback of what is happening. But when you have the API aggregation done on the native app, this is almost always bundled with having business logic uh, in, in, in the mobile app. So basically we were duplicating business logic into into the different uh, native apps. And this always leads to, to, to errors. And uh, it's not just the errors part, but, uh, uh, part, but it's also uh, the, the problem is the inconsistencies. The, one, the iOS team can, can implement things one way, Android team can implement the things different way, and we will end up with having a slightly different user experience. And we were aiming to to have a standard way how, how the user sees us as, as an application. And maybe the, the, the one thing that was like a major drawback for us in, in, this, uh, in this architecture was being coupled, uh, like every, every change that we wanted to introduce to the users and we want to push a lot of new and exciting things to our end users, but we were faced with, uh, with the need of releasing a, a new version of our native apps just to show something new to the users. And this was uh, not fast enough in, uh, in terms of where we want to, to go and how much new things we want to deliver to the users. That's why we, we, we started working on, uh, on, on our new, uh, new design in the backend. Basically, we wanted to remove this thin line between the back end and the front end. We wanted to, to make a clear distinction and to move more things to the back end so that we can, we can drive things faster and in, in a more scalable way. So we introduced the concept of, uh, we, we didn't want it to go uh, the, with the standard approaches of uh, having a, a global backend for front end service layer that, that will be, uh, there are approaches where you can have a backend for front end per platform, like have one for iOS, one for Android, and then these teams should, uh, will be the ones who will, uh, who will maintain this service. We wanted to, to go a, a bit different way. We wanted to have a presentation layer services which will be per domain, so each domain team will be, able, will be maintaining and uh, developing these services. So what we ended up, uh, the, the architecture that we implemented, it's currently live with, with several screens that we have in, in our application. Uh, so basically, we, we moved some of, uh, of the responsibilities that were in the native apps. The first thing that was obvious that we need to move was the aggregation part. In microservice architectures, uh, it's, it's a common design pattern to have aggregator services, but we didn't want to, st to, st to stop just there to have an aggregator services. We, we wanted to move some more functionality to, 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 to these services. So that's why uh, beside the, the aggregation part, we added the translations and the dynamic assets that are now being handled by, by our presentation layer services in. I'll have some slides to, to show you wh how it looks like. It, it basically, th these are the things we moved to our, to our uh, presentation layer services. So the API aggregation, the handling of dynamic assets, meaning that all the, the images, the logos, and everything you see, this is uh, being uh, sent through our uh, presentation layer services. This, uh, the services are handling the assets mainly in the responses you get from the presentation layer services. You, we sometimes send URLs to assets that we, we store on S3 buckets in Amazon, but ev everything is handled by, by our presentation layer service. Then we have the translations, and the last two parts is uh, we limited the usage of this presentation layer services to showing components for the, uh, uh, where the user in, uh, interaction is navigation from one screen to another. We are still not uh, using presentation layer services to show complex forms where the, uh, the user can input data. We are mostly showing UI, component, UI components where the user can navigate from 
one screen to the other. For example, like here we have the this uh, we the, the concept we call it a tile. And if the user clicks to this tile, it can uh, you can upgrade your N26 product from the standard one to one of our more premium products. For the navigation to to be possible, we implemented uh, our own kind of deep linking system that is across all platforms, uniform across, across all platforms. By, by a deep linking system, I'm not talking about the publicly available ones like you have the URL and when you click it, uh, you're automatically taken to, the scre uh, to, to this screen even if you, you click the URL from your email. Uh, we, we didn't want it, we, we still thought that this is a kind of a security risk because we wanted to, to be able to navigate everywhere in the app. So th these are just strings that, are, that our native apps are able to, to, uh, to process and to navigate the user to the correct screen. And uh, bundling with this, uh, every navigation action, we provide also tracking data from the backend and this helps, uh, will help us in, f in future to do experimentation and kind of A-B testing and see the end results of the changes we are pushing to the end users. So how we did, like, we implemented our first uh, uh, presentation layer service. I have actually people from my team here, so we can talk about all the details after the, the the talk, so if anyone is interested, we can get more into detail in what we did. Basically what we used, it's, it's a standard set of uh, technologies and frameworks. We used uh, Kotlin and Spring Boot. Uh, one thing we, uh, which is a bit uh, not very common to use it, because this service, it's by default a stateless service. It's, it's aggregating data from uh, from our uh, microservices on the back end, and then enriching and transforming this data, so adding the, the texts and translate it into the user locale, bundling up all the, all the digital assets like images, uh, and it's sending this to, to, to the front ends to, to be rendered visually. So for the configuration, because it's mostly configuration stuff, we, we need to configure these components, what to do, how to, uh, implement some kind of a DSL-like language where, where, where we, we define all these components. For this, we use the library called Hokun. It's, uh, it's configuration files that, uh, that are a bit more structured than YAML files. Uh, I'll show you a bit an example here. Basically, uh, on, on this side, we have, we have an, uh, an example of, of how we define components in our presentation layer service. And you will be able to see, like, uh, he, uh, here on, on the left side, we have the Hakun configuration for, for a component. And on the right side is the JSON uh, response from, from the presentation layer service. So here we have this, uh, here we have this, uh, uh, upgrade to uh, U layer. Basically, this is our premium product that we offer to 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 our. This is the mid tier layer that we offer to our customers, and basically we are able to uh, to define uh, certain parameters like when to show this uh, this specific uh, tile to the user. So this is being uh, being evaluated in in runtime to see what's the current product of the user, whether this user is eligible to get to the new one or, or is this product available in the country where the user is. So th this is being evaluated. Then all the, the strings here are, are being translated with using our translation service in the back end. We are generating the images with a lot of business logic to generate the links uh, from our S3 buckets where we store them. Then we have our URL mapping so that URI mapping so that the user can navigate when, when, uh, when it clicks when you click the button you're navigated to the new screen. So how, how exactly does it look like? Uh, this, this response from from the back end is then uh, uh, sent to our native apps and then it comes to this. Uh, NXD mapping layer where it's uh, it's mapped to visual components in the UI and this is exactly uh, like uh, 
the, this response on the left side it corresponds to, to the tile for the upgrade to N26U. Basically, the, this is how we push content from, uh, from the back end to, uh, to the front end. One other challenge that we faced while implementing this, this new strategy, this, this new architecture was versioning. Uh, we had a great talk previously about this, so I was really happy to hear a lot of talks around it. Currently, we haven't done any versioning in, in, in our APIs also. What we have done, we, we, we support forward compatibility, so we're able to evolve our components, add new, new things to them. Uh, if, you, if the client stays on, on the older version, of the application, you won't see just the, 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 the new updated user experience. In future, if we decide if we decide to to completely change the, the user experience, rework everything, we will start introducing versions. But because we are able uh, to to push content from the back end to the front end, we are able to push certain content to old users like. Uh, notifying them that they need to, to update to the new apps to, to get the new features. So, so basically we're, we will be able, uh, at least by my opinion, to easily deprecate the older versions and uh, to be able to maintain at least one or two versions and not, not needing to, to maintain several versions of this. To, to wrap up a bit, like what was the outcome and what we got from from all this? First, when we moved when we moved everything to to the back end, we gained a lot on performance because you do all the aggregation there, and also we are able now to use to use the this presentation layer services as kind of a caching layer so that we can reduce the load on our uh, domain microservices. We're able to handle resiliency better. So in case a service is, is not available and it's not crucial for, for the user, we're able to just degrade the user experience or to, to do some fallbacks like show the user di different, uh, different content on the UI, just, just showing that we have a feature but it's not just currently available. Uh, we have some... some uh, issues and we are working on them. So we're uh, and not showing just an error screen, but just partially not showing parts of the screen, some of the, of the visual things not being a, uh, rendered. We're able to do faster releases. By faster releases, I'm talking about able to push more content to, to the users without the need to wait for a native app release because we know that native app releases, no matter how good process we have, they, they won't be as fast, as fast as the things we have on the back end where we have our continuous deployment pipeline, where, where we have all the processes, where we follow the DevOps culture and where we're agile enough to, to push new features. Uh, native apps are, are still constrained by having, uh, having uh, uh, we have to submit the apps to, 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 to the uh, Android store, so they, this process takes time and it's not fast, uh, as fast as we want to, 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 to be. The other part is consistency. Having this approach, we are able to, we are sure that whatever we serve, it's going to show up in, 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 in all, all the platforms, across all the platforms, so, and we will have uniform experience if it's not a uniform experience that we know the problem is somewhere in the mapping layer where some components are visually not mapped to, to the correct ones and the, the front end teams can, can fix this. And one big advantage when, when having this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, an architecture is being able to do experiments because we are able to, to control the content from the front end. We are able to deliver different content to different users and run experiments on certain sets of users and see how the users accept our new features. Basically, we are, we are able to tease a new feature, just uh, show a new link on this page, hey, we are working of, on this very cool and exciting feature, please click to see more. And we can just show a page that is 
uh, that is being hosted on our CMS system just to see the users whether and to use the tracking data to see how excited are the users about this uh, check the u the usage patterns, move stuff around, and immediate and uh, and uh, create uh, a unique tracking data to see what changes in the user uh, usage patterns to see whether we need to tweak more our designs. What what are the things we can do to improve the user experience? So. Uh, are we done with this? I would say no. There are a lot of things to to go from here. Basically, we're as I said, for now we are only limited to showing users uh, components that are navigating the user from one screen to another or showing static content. Uh, we want to explore a bit whether it's, is it possible to use this uh, uh, for rendering any kinds of screens in the app. For for now, I'm not able to answer this question. Uh, we are not sure. We, we don't want to go too much into the direction of like implementing kind of an HTML uh, language of, of our own or s uh, CSS language. Uh, we, we want to still be uh, the, this to be kind of just a middle layer where uh, the, the front end part will still have the deciding uh, rule in uh, when rendering all the components. Uh, that would be, I think, all. If you have any questions. Uh... Thank you, Jordan. Uh, right on time. Yeah, we have already a question. Thanks for the presentation. Was was insightful. Um, uh, you were talking about mobiles all the time and this presentation layer in the middle. Yeah. Are you using the same presentation layer for web and why or why not? We, there is a plan of using it. Uh, the problem is that in our web application uh, still hasn't implemented this NXD layer and we want, once they do it, they will start uh, using this also. The plan is to start using it everywhere across all the platforms. For now, the, the main push was to, to use it in iOS and Android because we had this design layer system ready for them and we wanted them to, to start using it from scratch. Did you see any uh, downsides of moving to the BFF model? Because you mentioned a slide of you know gains, but was there anything that was a negative part of the change? Negative. I'm sorry. So far, not really. Uh, the the only problem I we the only concern we had was versioning. Uh, and uh, like the UI can evolve so much. And the problem with native apps is that y we know that adoption rate, especially in Android, is not that big. And we need a clear strategy to push users forward to our latest versions of the apps. Otherwise, we will end up maintaining the kind of a mess of a lot of visual components that will be just used uh, for a single user that is staying on a version of the app that is a year old. This is maybe the only concern that we have at the moment. Uh, questions? Well, I had a couple questions. So the first one was how common it is this Ocon uh, language and how easy it is to integrate with your other programming language because uh, it's n it's not a programming la uh, well language. It's just a library for okay. configuration files, and we are just using it to 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 extract the configuration data into Java uh, into Kotlin classes, and then then evaluate that. So basically, it's it's well covered. Uh, I have the main guy f that was working on, on on the service implementation here, so we can speak about all the details. It has a wrapper around Kotlin. It's mainly implemented in Java, but uh, we didn't face any major issues uh, implementing it. And uh, regarding the basically the architecture backend for frontend, do you see this uh, uh, backend for frontend as a single point of failure? I mean, are you taking any extra precaution on this uh, additional backend, or it just it has the same type of, uh, let's just say, resiliency as the actual uh, backends? For now, it has the same, uh, like, 
it it's adding things in terms of the as I said the data aggregation part if part of the aggregation fails we're able to to provide uh, fallback data but if the back end for front end fails then it's a single point of failure for the front end and this screen will not be we will not the front end will not be able to render it for now we don't have we don't want to do like uh, implement logic in the front ends that will call the other Got services. Uh, what we can do, since this is a stateless service, we can we can scale it independently as much as we want because we can have 10, 20 instances and to like over provision it just to make sure that we have always enough capacity to serve all the requests because it's it's a lightweight service. It doesn't have a data store. It it's just a mapping layer. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Oh, one last question. Hi, I, I don't understand if uh, uh, the, the transformation layer it's um, stateless or not. Yes, it is. For now, it's it's stateless because we didn't uh, we didn't had any any requirements to do some dynamic data like use a data store from somewhere in future if we. If we want to push even more dynamic data and we, f we see that, that we will benefit from a data store, we'll do it. But for now, it's just aggregating data from different domains and showing it to the user. Just Thank enriching you. and transforming. Thank you. No problem. Thank you again, Jordan. Thanks. <laughs>